Um, when Liz first suggested that we do something on campaigning, I thought, this is fantastic. And then I started to organize my notes and hit a wall of paralysis. Um, because it's a tricky subject and we've only got 10 minutes to discuss it. Um, the session is focused on messaging and tone, and I don't want to step too far outside of that, but I am going to step outside of it just a little bit, because I don't believe that messaging and tone arise out of a vacuum. They come from who we perceive ourselves to be as campaigners, uh, from our own personalities, from what our goals are, and the habits that we've fallen into. So I'm going to have a go. At, at sort of saying what I think about it in the absolute <laughs> knowledge that, of course, <laughs> I don't get it right all the time either, that I have my own habits, that I have my own perceptions, and that I'm only human. So, there we go. This is new to me. The first thing I want to say is that there are lots of ways to campaign, and I wouldn't want to sound <coughs> negative about any of them, because they all have a positive role to play. But equally, it's really easy to slip into the ineffective side of, of campaigning. And, you know, as a species, campaigners are, are quite well studied. There's a lot of social scientists that have looked into who we are and what we do and how we do the things we do. And although this chart is quite old, I think it makes quite a pithy contribution to some, some of the basic approaches of campaigning and how we can sometimes step off the path. Campaigning, as Liz alluded to, is, is the art of persuasion and that implies a relationship. And relationships bring with them challenges such as being aware and responsive to other people's views and goals or uh, supporting a sense that we're all in this together, for instance by uh, drawing on a shared past or painting a picture of uh, a shared future or making it safe for people to open up and have questions and comments and concerns and it's the relationship that we make with our audience that makes people more likely to listen to you to sign petitions, to send off letters and emails, to join local groups, to host activities, to attend meetings in other words, to evolve from a disconnected group into a constituency, which is what we all want. And when you slip into the ineffective side of the chart, <coughs> you're essentially putting the blocks on that relationship. <coughs> so, from my point of view, today, more than ever, I believe that we need, uh, the work that we do, rather, as NGOs and campaigners, is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Every day we see examples of the inadequacies of government, of our economic and legal system, of the, the marketplace, and, and civil society organizations and campaigners help to address these inadequacies and put them into context and also provide some checks and balances in society. That's, that's really our role. And we take on these challenges that the public and private sectors don't want to take on. Um, we can think the thoughts and take the risks that are economically unacceptable to business and politically unacceptable to government, and which often go unarticulated in the media. And some of that leading edge thinking can eventually form the basis of cultural and political reform, though as a lot of people in this room know that is a very long journey. And what that implies is that campaigners occupy a unique position of leadership, even though many of us don't think of ourselves as leaders, and even though many people on the other side think of us as bothersome little oiks. And with that comes a responsibility to exemplify the qualities of leadership, to understand your audience, to be informed and persuasive and mm. diligent and honest and, it's a long list, open-minded, creative and accountable, <coughs> which is something that Liz alluded to in her talk as well. And from time to time I think also to review your effectiveness. So my question in this context of tone 
and messaging is, does our movement exemplify those qualities? Because there's no doubt in my mind that we have the moral authority, we have the weight of scientific opinion on our side, and we have the weight of public opinion on our side, but do we use those gifts in the most persuasive way? Do we communicate them effectively to the outside world, uh, the world outside of our closed communities? And I really realize the irony of saying that in this setting, in this room, amongst people who've been doing it for a very long time. So as I, if, as I, as we consider um, some of the questions, it's worth remembering that, that campaigning also is a very mature and in some ways these days very corporate activity. And like lots of established organizations and corporations, it's become very set in its ways. Um, it can in some ways be backward looking, which could also mean that it's in danger of stagnating. And sometimes I wake up in the morning after a particularly hard day of campaigning and I wonder how different things might look if we stop talking about what we did in the past, what we did in 1976 or 1989 or 1996 or 2006, because it's 2016 and we have to look forward. And in my increasingly long lifetime, the world has changed immeasurably and the pace of that change is, is gathering momentum. And I always ask myself, what would happen if we approached campaigning with a kind of tabula rasa approach? If we simply woke up one morning and realized <clears throat> that our food system was under threat, um, what would we do? What would the message be? How would we manage that and communicate that to the public? Uh, this is where I get on my soapbox. Because this year has been um, particularly challenging for me in terms of the messaging that uh, we've given out as, as a group, all of us. Um, everywhere I've turned, I've seen stories proclaiming that Europe has totally banned GMOs. Um, and I see this as a way of kind of not stepping back and looking at the big picture, uh, or, or maybe even sometimes creating a deliberate controversy or an argument. <coughs> and by the way, both sides do this. Um, some of you may have seen the BBC program, Panorama program on the BT Brinjal in June, which sort of deliberately twisted the facts as well. So nobody's immune from it. But one example from our side was the press and social media around the EU opt-outs, because every headline I read, as I said, said, ooh, you know, Europe is totally GM-free. Um, the problem is the way the law is written, we have to object to every new application as it comes out. So, okay, we're past the first six or seven, but we're going to have to keep doing this again and again <coughs> and again. And more importantly, requesting an opt-out didn't mean that farmers or governments in those countries were necessarily dead set against GM. Um, in fact, we noticed when we were reading the letters to the European Commission that the country responses were really varied and interestingly nuanced. And some of them, notably Holland, were really clear that they were going to judge future applications on their merits. In the meantime, when you take into account the, the import of GMO feed and foods and the ongoing field trials, Europe is still very much in a holding pattern, or as an old boyfriend of mine who played a lot of battleships and as you said, we're celebrating sinking the Swiss Navy. So the question arises again in my mind, does the messaging work in our favor or does it undermine what we are trying to say and the relationships that we're trying to build with the public? Two minutes, please. Yeah. GMOs are a complex subject and the broad arguments aren't going to get any simpler. There will be new crops that will be harder to object to under current EU regulations and new genetic modification techniques that are at the moment unregulated and the sessions yesterday on emerging new technologies and the corruption of agricultural science I think threw up some interesting um, information in that regard. And you know the biotech companies are playing a long game and they're relying on complex legal arguments, many of which are linked to international economics and trade agreements like TTIP to try and keep these processes and the products that they produce unregulated. And now the PR machinery on that side of things is arguing that actually, um, and this was, this was 
published recently in Grist by Nathaniel Johnson, who's one of the new uh, pro-GMO darlings, that GMOs don't exist at all, that they are a figment of our imagination, and therefore they're not worthy of anybody's angst, and they're not worthy of any regulatory angst either. And you know what? There will be new straw men as well. There will be new Mark Linuses. There will be new Kevin Falters. There will be new science babes whose only purpose is to draw our focus away from the real, the core issues of GM. So, that's my last slide. So as I said at the beginning, um, there's merit in every type of approach to campaigning. And inevitably, of course, I'm coming from who I am and what I know and what we're trying to achieve beyond GM. But underpinning everything that all of us do, I think, should be the key issues and goals. And however we approach campaigning, the sheer complexity of GMOs means that there is a need for constant review and constant revision about how we communicate and what we communicate and whether we're connecting with our audience at a human level, whether we are educating and bringing clarity to the arguments or whether we are muddying the waters. And I hope that we can tease some of that out of you. You all have those little sheets to fill in. Um, some of you have said no, but I hope some of you fill them in um, so that we can have a broader discussion during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you.